you're, you're now recognized. Good afternoon, Chair Omenishu, Ranking Member Guthrie, and members of the subcommittee. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to the long COVID experience and to shed light on the barriers that patients face that you have the power to do something about. I am testifying today as a long COVID patient and as a member of the leadership team of the Patient-Led Research Collaborative, a group of long COVID patients with backgrounds in research, policy, and data analysis who were the first to conduct research on long COVID. My symptoms began on March 14th, 2020. Like many of what we call first waivers, I was not afforded a COVID test because at the time tests were limited to hospitalized patients and those with shortness of breath, cough, and fever, the last of which I didn't have. I was told when I had doctor to isolate and within two weeks I'd be recovered. A month later, I was in worse health than in that initial stage. I couldn't walk more than 20 seconds without having trouble breathing, my heart racing, and being unable to get out of bed the rest of the day. My story is not unique, and this was evident when I had the body politics of the corporate hospital and people Patient-led research collaborative was born and we conducted a survey of 640 patients documenting these symptoms and experiences. The result was the first study on long COVID and the first to document numerous neurological symptoms and extensive multi-organ impact of the illness. It was clear then, one year ago, that the death recovery binary that COVID has been framed to be is simply not true. Our research helped raise awareness of the illness and got the attention of the CDC, NIH, and WHO. Our most recent survey asked about 205 symptoms over seven months and received almost 7,000 responses. In our recent paper, 92% of respondents were not hospitalized, but still experienced symptoms in nine out of 10 organ systems on average. We found that patients in their seventh month of illness still experienced 14 symptoms on average. The most commonly reported were fatigue, post-exertional malaise, and cognitive dysfunction. In fact, 88% experienced cognitive dysfunction and memory loss, impacting their ability to work, communicate, and drive. We found that this was as likely in 18 to 29 year olds as those over 60. Lesser known symptoms include tremors, reproductive changes, months long fevers, and vertigo. Over two thirds require a reduced work schedule or cannot work at all due to their health condition. 86% experience relapses where exerting themselves physically or mentally can result in a host of symptoms returning. Long COVID is complex, debilitating, and terrifying, but patients aren't just dealing with their symptoms. They're dealing with barriers to care, financial stability, and recovery. Due to the lack of a positive COVID test alone, patients are being denied access to post-COVID clinics, referrals to specialists, health insurance coverage, COVID-related paid leave, workers' comp, disability benefits, workplace accommodations, and participation in research. When we know that not everyone had access to COVID testing, that PCR tests have false negative rates of 20 to 40 percent, that antibody tests are more accurate on men and people over 40, and that multiple studies have shown that there is no difference in symptoms between those with a positive test and those without, why are we preventing people who are dealing with real symptoms from accessing what they need to survive? Even with a positive test, patients are still being denied benefits or have to wait months until they kick in. Medical bills are piling up. People are being forced to choose between providing for themselves and their family and doing what's best for their body. The toll that having inadequate paid leave, workplace protections, and benefits will take on our economic and healthcare systems over the next several decades is of a magnitude like we haven't seen before. As COVID continues, more and more people are developing long COVID. Waiting lists for post-COVID clinics keep getting longer, and yet many clinicians continue to gaslight us and tell us that our symptoms are in our head. This is particularly true for people of color, women, and the LGBTQ community. I am both privileged in my financial stability and lucky that people with ME advised me early on to PACE, which allowed me to continue working. But I wanna mention something. Those stimulus checks that you all provided us to get through the pandemic, I do really appreciate them but every cent of mine was spent on urgent care and doctor's visits where I was repeatedly told that my tachycardia, my inability to exercise and brain fog was caused by anxiety and there was no way that I could have had COVID since I didn't have a positive test. Post viral illnesses are not new. The cracks in our system that long COVID has exposed are not new. It's just that now more people are paying attention. We are counting on you, members of the committee, to use the power your constituents gave you to address these issues head on to listen to and work alongside the disabled and chronically ill community to prevent more people from becoming ill. I understand these are big challenges and big topics to address, 
but at this point, there's no other option. Thank you so much for inviting me to speak to you today. I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Ms. McCorkle. And that's exactly why we called uh, you as witnesses today. Uh, so uh, thank you very, very much. Uh,